You're listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast, episode number 186. Welcome to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. Business advice so easy, you'll feel like you're cheating. And now your host, Amy Porterfield. Welcome back to another episode of the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Porterfield, and today we are talking all things blogging. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, Amy, why are we talking about blogging? Isn't that so 2007? What about live video and Instagram and Facebook Live and live streaming and all that stuff that I've been talking about over and over again on my social media platforms and on this podcast? And yes, live video is so important and I want you to keep doing it and I want you to use it on social media. However, We've got to talk about the fundamentals of an online business as well. So we're taking a step back from some of the sexier stuff that we like to talk about, and we're going to talk about a fundamental piece of your business, and that is your blog. Now, for me, my blog really is a place where I post my show notes for each week's podcast, but those show notes essentially are like mini blog posts. Even if you have a video show, you're going to have a post on your website for each of those videos that you create. So whether you have a podcast or a video show or a traditional blog where you are sitting down and you're writing blog articles each week, you need to have that foundation in your business. And one thing that is very certain in the world that I live in, in the world I teach in, in terms of online marketing, all of my mentors, all of those people that I follow and I look up to, and I know that they are financially successful in their business, they all have a central hub where they create content on a weekly basis. Many of them have a traditional blog where they post every single week on their blog. And so it's important that we look at that foundation inside of your online business and make sure that it's healthy, make sure that it really is driving traffic and getting traction. And that's exactly why I wanted to talk about blogging today. Now, I brought an expert on because my friend, Julie Solomon, is an expert blogger, and she teaches blogging to her audience, and she knows what works and what doesn't work. And we're going to talk about what is working, the mistakes that most bloggers make. We're going to talk about a really cool concept that she uses called trigger words, and we're going to talk about the overall health of your blog. Whether you're just starting to blog or if you've been at it for a while, I want you to listen to the tips and tricks that Julie shares and do an assessment on your own blog. Make sure that you are doing these different strategies that she teaches in order to make the most of your blog. And maybe it means you have to go back and do a little tinkering and tweaking of your blog in order to give it a makeover to be stronger and to get the traction that you're looking for. Because the last thing we want is to sit down and spend hours on these beautiful blog posts that we're creating. We put our blood, sweat, and tears into that content that we put out every week, and then nobody sees it. That's the last thing that we want, right? So we're going to talk about how to make sure that you have a blog set up for success. I'm going to give you a little teaser that Julie actually doesn't blog every week. And you know, that's what I teach, right? We're showing up every single week with original content, but she has a little twist to it. And I thought it was interesting. And I love to hear other people's perspective and how they do business and what works for them. So you might find it interesting how much she blogs and the great traction that she gets from her frequency. So it's just a different way to look at it. So I won't make you wait any longer. Let's bring on Julie. Julie, thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It is truly an honor. I'm so excited to be chatting with you today. I am too, because we have prepared some really great high value content for my listeners today. But before we get there, I want you to tell my listeners who don't yet know all about you a little bit about your story, how you got to where you are today and what you do in your business. 
Sure. So I started my career actually after I graduated from the University of Tennessee. I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee, and started my career in New York City doing music publicity. I majored in journalism and PR and electronic media, went straight to New York. I had only been there once before for like a journalism college trip and just decided two months before I graduated that that's where I wanted to go. So I moved there with no job, no place to live, no friends, which always kind of seems to work well for me whenever I put myself in these (laughs) really like high ridden anxiety and stressful places. I, I take action. So through a mix of doing a lot of just, you know, trying to network and meet people and sending a lot of emails. Finally got a job after a couple of months of of being up there and actually ended up getting a job at one of the top boutique music PR firms. It was a room full of fantastic women. It's still there today and got to assist under a very prominent music publicist. So when I was there, I got to work with acts like Def Leppard and Lenny Kravitz and Pink and Maroon 5 and all of these just really big, big names. And so you're kind of thrown into the trenches, if you will. And I always say I kind of learned in one year what somebody else would have learned in five, just because of the amount of work and the exposure that I was able to get there and just the fantastic women that I was able to just absorb on a daily basis. And then I had an opportunity to actually go back home. I had kind of gotten to a a crossroads in New York that I was like, okay, I'm either going to invest my life to this city and, you know, this is how I'm, I'm going to live. And it's interesting that when you kind of get to that crossroads and you may be able to relate to this as well, I started to kind of look at the women who were above me, so to speak, to say like, okay, is this the life that I want to live? Because this is the path that I'm on. Yeah. So when I started to realize that I, that that New York way of, of hustle and of grind wasn't really what I wanted for the entirety of my life, I got an opportunity to move home and actually work for Thomas Nelson Inc., which is now owned by Harper Collins. It is the largest Christian publishing house in the world. And I got to go in-house. Were you there when Michael Hyatt was there? I was. He was oh, the CEO at the time. So cool. Yes. I had no idea. Yeah. So we would have, you know, pizza Fridays with Mike and <laughs> and download all of the good stuff. And and it was kind of during that time. So Mike was there at the beginning and kind of halfway through my time there. And then he had left halfway through to kind of go on to do what he obviously does now, you know, just yes. being this online mega entrepreneur and, and educator. But got to do a lot of amazing stuff there, you know, really got my my feet wet in the corporate side of things. I in New York, I did the boutique side of things. And then I kind of hit that crossroads again, as most people in corporate jobs can at at a time when you find yourself in 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 the little, you know, windowless room and kind of thinking, okay, I'm living in someone else's dream again. And although this is great and wonderful and I've learned so much, I'm ready to really tackle my own. So myself and another girl who had actually worked at Thomas Nelson as well joined forces, started our own book PR firm, which we still actively run today called OMG Publicity. And when we left HarperCollins and Thomas Nelson, they essentially became a client. So we still actually work with them as literally as of today, we have three of their book campaigns now and have started doing that in like 2012, met my husband, got pregnant with our son, moved to Los Angeles because that's where my husband was. He's an actor and he's lived out here for over 25 years and he wasn't going anywhere. So I knew that if we were going to actually be married and have a baby, I needed to kind of live with him. I think that that was (laughs) an important part of the equation. So kind of the long story short with that, I moved to LA, was now running, co-running OMG publicity, and then found myself at this other crossroads. I had was pregnant, barefoot and pregnant, didn't know anyone in LA and wanted to meet other women. And so I did what every young woman in LA does when they move here. I started a blog. And when I started a blog, I started to meet a lot of fantastic women. And then also from my years of background in publicity, I knew I did know people out here kind of on the media side of things. So I would go to certain events or I would start networking and I was really getting into this influencer blogger space. And my blog in the beginning was just kind of like a hobby. You know, I was I was blogging about moving to L.A. and my new experiences as a mom and kind of more motherhood stuff. But what I quickly realized realized from all of the amazing women that I was meeting out here, one of my good friends, Angela Lanter was saying, you know, I really think that if you started blogging about PR, like people would be really interested in that. 
And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, there's nothing fun or exciting about that. Like, I should be doing this other kind of blogging because that's what, you know, to me at the time in LA, that was really the only type of blogging that I was seeing was this lifestyle, fashion, beauty, motherhood stuff. Yeah. And she was like, no, she was like, I really do think Angela, for example, is, is a massive YouTuber and a, a huge blogger. But she was like, I really think that other big bloggers like me could really benefit from the tools and the, and kind of the tricks of the trade that you have that we don't have because we haven't spent the last 10 years in PR and marketing. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll try it and see what happens. And I tested it out and it, and she was right. And, um, so many of my other blogger friends were kind of right. And, and that just kind of took off. So I rebranded my blog. It then tripled my engagement, which we can talk about today, how I did that and the process of that. And then I kind of became a blogger for bloggers, so to speak. I really started to use my blog and my website as a as a resource to help other bloggers and creatives and influencers out there up-level their brand and their business and their income. I created a course, which we can talk about later as well, that, that helps influencers and, and bloggers pitch themselves and kind of become their own publicist, so to speak. And then earlier this year, I founded the Influencer Podcast, which is just another way to spread the good news. And I really love that because I get to have some amazing people like yourself on that podcast to really share the tips and the secrets behind this crazy world of online entrepreneurship and influencer marketing. And here we are today. (laughs) <laughs> and here we are today. I absolutely love your podcast. It was so fun talking to you on your podcast. We did one all about list building. And I absolutely find value in hearing other people's stories, where they are today and how they got there. So thanks so much for sharing that. some of that stuff. Obviously, I didn't know all of it with the Michael Hyatt connection. I didn't realize you guys had overlapped there. I think that's really cool. Okay. So thank you so much for sharing your story. And I want to get into the topic of the day, which is all about blogging, but you have a unique perspective and you do it better than most. And that's why I wanted to bring you on the show. So a lot of my listeners may have already started their blog. Heck, they might've been at it for a while now, but I still want to start from the very beginning and talk about the first steps listeners need to do before ever creating their blog. Because some people might look back and think, Ooh, I skipped those steps. Maybe I need to back up just a bit. Absolutely. So I always like to think of it, you know, whereas social media channels like Facebook or definitely Instagram is kind of where we all go to connect and then convert. What I love to do is really look at the blog as kind of like the headquarters. You know, that's where the heart lives. That's where the story and the brand of the business truly stems from and truly lies. So thinking it from that perspective, I like to really get down to the basics of figuring out the first kind of steps. And and for me, that is always getting really super clear on who you're talking to, because I'm a huge believer that if you're talking to everybody, you're really talking to nobody. And I think that that's something as bloggers, just through years of really testing and trying different things out, you kind of have to figure out for yourself. But what I have learned and what I think a lot of the people that I know around me and students and whatnot have learned is that if you start to specifically talk to the person that you're trying to attract that person will be drawn to your brand and your blog because it feels like it was created for them and their needs. And so a way to really get more specific about that audience, what they look like and where you can find them is really kind of just the how. So what I always like to do is I like to encourage people or even myself when I get at this crossroads of of wanting to get clear on your audience, because even if you're just starting out blogging or maybe you've been in it for five years and you're just kind of starting to fill a plateau. That may be when you need to kind of go back to those basics a little bit. So I like to look back over the last few years of my career or or someone's career and call to mind those people that you most enjoyed spending time with and that you most enjoyed working with. Those people that, you know, you had a great connection with, a relationship with, those people who really gave you that kind of energy and left you feeling more confident and fulfilled in the work that you do. I think that that's always a really good place to start because it's so much easier to kind of break that down and talk to that one person or that small group of people than trying to talk to a void of people. And it's an easier way to kind of get clear on who you are talking to. And then once you kind of can paint that picture visually, you can start by asking yourself questions like, 
what is this person coming to me for? What kind of services am I going to be able to deliver to them in a unique way? Am I going to be offering incentives? Am I going to be providing information? Am I going to be offering some kind of upgraded opportunity? You know, what am I really going to be giving them that's unique on this space? And how are they going to be able to connect with me to contact me? And then from there, we can start to learn more about them. And there's actually a worksheet that I have on my website that I like to get super weird and specific about the things that I want to know. Some people may think it's weird. I think that it's really fun. (laughs) I'll start to ask questions like, what is their favorite margarita flavor when they're going out for a taco Tuesday with their girlfriends after a long day at work? What are conversations are they talking about? What are the three books that they just took on their last girls trip? And not only what are those three books, but then once they read those three books, what are they going back to tell their girlfriends about that book? Things, of course, the demographics of obviously who, how old they are, male or female, where, where do they live? But I like to get really specific on, you know, what kind of car do they drive? What's the last YouTube video they might've uploaded? Who do they love to follow on Instagram? Are they a fan of Real Housewives or not? Because I feel like the more that you can really visualize who this person is, and as far as going to like give them a name, the the easier that it is of really getting clear on who that person is and then how you can show up for them. Okay. So I'm going to ask you kind of a weird question, but I know my audience asks this a lot. They'll say something like, well, how the heck am I supposed to know what kind of margarita they like on Taco Tuesday? Mm-hmm. I like to start off, I think in the beginning, if it's kind of a twofold, if you don't really have an audience at all yet, you have to be thinking of, well, maybe what kind of margarita would I like on a taco Tuesday? Yes. Because what I've noticed, especially if you're just starting out, is that if you don't know your audience at all and you're trying to cultivate it, what you'll start to find out when you start answering all those fun word questions that I was talking about earlier is that they start to kind of become a mirror of yourself. Because at the end of the day, what you're trying to provide with your blog is a service that maybe you were seeking somewhere that you couldn't find. So you may find that initially. Now, as you go on to maybe needing to kind of refresh your audience, or maybe you've hit a plateau, then of course you could pull some things like insights, analytics, perhaps you survey the current audience that you do have and actually ask them these questions. I'm a big fan of surveying. So that's another way that you can get clear on that as well. Yes, definitely. And I think the whole point there, you're thinking like, what do margaritas have to do with what the heck I'm selling or any topic? Topic like that, but you're making your avatar more human to you and you're expanding your conversation with them when you start to learn more about them, or you're just making educated guesses around what they like, who they are and what they're talking about. And as you get to know them more, those educated guesses actually become more of the truth. So you've got to start somewhere. And I think this exercise is so important. So I love the idea of, even if you already have a blog going back and asking yourself, okay, Really quick, I'm looking at my blog here and I need to get clear. Who am I talking to? What is my greater mission here? And is my message on target? And I think just doing a reevaluation is so important there. Yes. And then when you, when you get clear on that, on that audience and like what you were saying, I love that you use the word truth because that truth is going to lead to that mission. Right. And so the only thing when it comes to the mission, you've got the audience figured out. And then the only thing that you really do need to start to really grow your, your business and cultivate it is getting clear on that mission. And so I like to kind of tackle these three statements, if, if you will, I feel that you need to find a problem that real people are having in the real world. You need to create a solution for that problem, which is your audience, obviously. And then you need to get that solution in front of your audience who have the problem. And it doesn't need to necessarily be in the best way possible. It's just about doing it unique, not necessarily better. How can you uniquely show up? What is the most unique way that you can reach them? What are you providing and how are you going to be a solution provider for them? Gotcha. Okay. Very cool. I like that word unique because a lot of what I've teach has been done before. Other people teach it, but I have a unique style of doing so. So it doesn't mean that my style is better, but it's going to attract people that really like that style of teaching. So I think that word unique is so important there. Absolutely. Okay. So now I want to walk through the different elements that make up a great post. So if somebody's going to post on their blog, I want you to talk about what are those elements that they need to be paying attention to? 
When when it comes to the element, I really do think about the story and the message, right? Like what really is the story here? I feel that the message and the post should really be the story that connects your ideas and then converts and compels your audience to kind of continue to become loyal readers of the blog. So typically the story, the message, the post will stem from these five core values. So it's kind of going to set the stage for your blog post, so to speak. The first is educate. Are you going to be someone that's showing up every day to educate your ideal reader? So you need to ask yourself, what are they going to be learning from me? What am I going to be providing that is going to be beneficial from them from an educational standpoint? What am I going to be teaching them? Of course, we have great people like yourself, like Jasmine Starr, like Lewis Howe, who does this beautifully. They really do come from this place of wanting to educate. The second one is inspire. And these are obviously going to be people of how am I showing up every day to make this person's situation or day or life better in my blog post. So I always love to think of travel blogs. Airbnb actually has a great blog that is super inspirational. The Every Girl Home Edit, of course, Super Soul Sunday. These are the types of blogs that are coming with that full impact of inspiration to really uplift us and make our day and our lives better. Perhaps you're a blogger out there who wants to entertain. So in that in that perspective, you're going to be thinking, okay, I'm going to be going kind of a softer format here. You know, I'm, I'm kind of looking to help people take a break in their day. Maybe I'm going to be offering some kind of escape from their hustle and bustle. So I always like to think of those blogs like the awkward family photos, you know, passive aggressive notes. Uh, Jenny Lawson from the blog S is a fantastic entertainment based blogger, the ones that are really just going to make you laugh. And, and that is really their core mission every day when they show up on the blog. The fourth is going to be more of the behind the scenes. So this is going to be the blogger that says, okay, my reader really do have an interest in my life or in the process that I do something. So Food bloggers are a great example of this because they're really going to be showing you the demo driven behind the scenes of their recipes and how they put together the amazing food that they're creating. Celebrities are another fantastic example that their readers really want to see kind of more of the behind the scenes of their life. And then, of course, fashion bloggers. There's a lot of fashion bloggers out there like Olivia Palermo or Mariana Hewitt that their readers really do want to feel like they are walking their life with them every day. And so the behind the scenes is really going to be where they're coming from. And then the fifth one that is a core value for a blog would be community. So these are going to be the bloggers that are coming from this the space of this is my blog is a place where I'm building a community. I'm making people a part of something greater than myself. So Rising Tide Society is a great example of that. The Momastery, which is Glennon Doyle Melton, The Glitter Guide. These are blogs that really come come from a place of, of building community, and that's going to be their first priority there. Such great examples. I'm going to list all of these in the show notes. So amyporterfield.com forward slash 186. If you missed one or you wanted to check one out that Julie mentioned, I'll list them all. Okay. So I want to talk about consistency when it comes to generating content each week. What are some ways you can be more consistent in your delivery? Because if anybody follows, if you all follow my podcast religiously, then you know that I talk about consistency of content a lot. I actually did an entire podcast about how to show up more consistently in your business. I'll link to that in the show notes as well, if that's something you struggle with. But I want to talk about consistency, exactly how it relates to blogging. So can you give us some tips here? Absolutely. When it comes to consistency with blogging, consistency is key. And I know that that sounds kind of redundant and generic because we've always heard that, but it really is every day, the same process and the same flow, no matter if your schedule may be different. Obviously, every priority needs to be scheduled by that level of importance, as well as how long it's going to take you to complete. So when it comes to consistency, everyone may be thinking, okay, that sounds great, but how? The easiest way that I have figured out to hold myself accountable as a blogger and stay consistent online is by batching. And that is just my way of really being able to plan out the things that I need to get done in advance. So, you know, are my blog posts going to have launches in them that I need to be aware of and be mindful of to plan in advance? Are there going to be seasonal tie-ins? Are there going to be vacations or holidays that I'm going to be talking about? Are there going to be things that are 
more evergreen that they can kind of be planned a little bit more in a flow? Or are they going to be something that's more open closed that are going to have deadlines onto them? So I like to really kind of look at it at big picture and what I actually do with all of my blog content. And if I was really amazing and could do it for the entire year, that would be awesome that I actually go quarter by quarter because that's my brain can kind of hold at one time, but I go quarter by quarter on a really big desktop calendar. So I found one off of Amazon that I use and I literally go week by week, month by month, quarter by quarter of everything that I'm planning out. And I put it on the big desktop calendar first. Once I get all of those specifics laid out, and what I like about the desktop calendar is that it's just going to give you the space. For me, I really need the space to write things, ideas, rewrite, move things around, highlight things, white out things. I just, I need that space. So that gives me that space. And then once things kind of get firmed up, I can then put them in a structured Google calendar that is specifically just for my blog content. And that is where that goes. And it allows me to kind of plan in advance and make sure that I'm not really kind of missing anything. And then the way that I tackle it weekly, once it's kind of in the monthly thing is that I take one day a week and for me, it's Sunday. And that's where I plan out most of the content for that week. So I will be pulling in and that's essentially my batch day for the week. So I'm going to be pulling in any images that I'm going to need. I'm going to be getting my headlines drafted. I'm going to be getting my copy for the most part drafted. So I'm not really overwhelmed in the moment that I'm going to post. And that way I only need to kind of go back with minor edits of anything. But for the most part, that blog post is really going to be ready to go in that moment. And then another thing that I will do kind of throughout the week before I post is that if something else kind of pops into my brain, I'll just add those in the notes section of my phone or even give myself kind of a a voice memo. And that way it's pen to paper. I don't have to get kind of anxious about remembering it. And it really does help me kind of copy and paste it later on down the road. And that's how I show up every, every time and really try to stay consistent with my schedule and really the content that I'm creating. I love how you have the big calendar on your desk because I recently did a podcast episode about planning for the new year. And I think it's important that you have the space to write the notes, change things around, and then look at everything big picture. So I'm a really pen and paper kind of girl as well. So I really encourage all of you to do it physically, like actually put it in front of you. I want you to have your pens and your markers and your highlighters in front of you. It just changes the experience. I think. It absolutely does. And it gives you this template, so to speak, that is flexible because of course life changes, schedule changes, but it, it allows you to stay flexible while at the same time accountable. So very true. Now, what are some big mistakes that you see most bloggers make? Because some people listening right now are just really struggling to get the traction with their blogs. And I'm wondering if they might see themselves in some of these mistakes that you see your students doing on a pretty regular basis. For me, I think that the biggest challenges, mistakes that we can all find ourselves in as bloggers, really, the first one is that forcedness sometimes that we make with ourselves of trying to fit in. And what I always go back to people on and, and always try to remind them about is that you really do have to go back to that idea of who it is that you're talking to, how are you showing up for them today to be their solution provider, and how are they best going to find this information. So really, first and foremost, it's just about not really worrying so much about fitting in. And I think a lot of times when we start to not necessarily stay on our own page, we start to go to other people's pages and we kind of continue to look at what everyone else is doing for our inspiration from logos to colors to designs. All of a sudden, we start to look a little uniform. So my biggest encouragement over that mistake is just to keep the focus on the work that you're doing and really getting clear on what's important for your growth. And that is what is going to set you apart. And it's also going to allow you to create what you need to create before you start consuming everything else around you. I love it. Makes perfect sense. And how about, I think you had one more, right? Yes. So the other thing that I see a lot of times is that the about me sections are not very utilized effectively. And I see this across the board, not only with blogs, but on social media as well. I think that a lot of times it is kind of natural for us to waste that precious space in the about me section, kind of stating the obvious, you know, someone will say, I love jewelry and I love style. And it's like, well, of course you do. You're a jewelry designer on Etsy, you know? So it's like, I'm glad that you love what you do, but tell me about 
something about that that I didn't already know. You know, what is the story behind that? What, why do you love jewelry? Does it remind you of when you were a little girl and you would look up and you would see your mom putting jewelry on to get ready, you know, to go on a date with your dad? And that inspired you to love the beauty of jewelry. And then it inspired you to create it one day. You know, really tell me kind of the story about what has really cultivated your passion and your desire to want to do this. And that really kind of goes back to remembering that the blog is where the heart lies. The blog is the headquarters. So you really need to make sure that you're utilizing this to share the story and not just state the obvious. Oh, makes perfect sense for sure. Now, I know that we talked about how to nail down your content. So let's talk about promoting your newest blog post because it's one thing to get the content up there, especially if you're doing it every week, you're working your tail off, but how about getting traffic to that blog? Yes. And so this is kind of a catch 22 as well, because what is so great at promoting is actually kind of another mistake that I see people make. So I'm going to kind of explain what I, what I mean by that. But one of the ways that I love promoting is something called the 80, 20 rule. And a lot of people might have heard this in, in many various forms, but I'm going to kind of explain to you how I use it to promote my content as well as how I also use it to not make the mistake of blogging every day. Okay. So, you know, we all know that the secret to kind of building engagement with the raving fan base, so to speak, that's ready to buy anything that you're selling really comes down to not really how much content you're creating, but how good the content is, right? Quality over quantity. But a lot of people have this mindset that you should be spending all of your time creating this content and rarely ever spend an equal, if not more amount of time promoting that content. So I, when I kind of noticed that I was doing this myself, I had to kind of sit back and like, think about it. And I was like, okay, I'm writing a new blog post almost every day. And I promote that blog post once, maybe twice on my, you know, various social media platforms and so on and so forth. Maybe I do an ad, who knows, and I move on. But what if I actually spent more time promoting that content that's already there? Not only does your blog posts get in front of new eyes, but we also start saving ourselves so much of that blog overwhelm. So that's why I started spending 80% of my time promoting my blog content and only 20% of my time creating new blog content. Whereas before it was flipped, it was 80% of the time creating the content and only 20% of the time promoting that. So I like to think of it this way. If, if we spend, you know, time release of blog content and, and as bloggers out there listening, you know how much time that takes, right? And we just talked about batching and kind of planning in advance. All of that takes time. So if you do that and you spend all that time and energy writing that amazing content and that content only gets seen by a thousand readers, the chances are there's probably hundreds of thousands of more readers out there who could benefit from what you just wrote. So why do we always spend time creating the content when we already have something that's ready to go for our ideal customers? We just haven't gotten it to them yet. So it's really difficult for bloggers and businesses, particularly those who are kind of new to the game, to find an audience for their content. This means that they may need to work a little bit extra hard on the front end of creating content. But once you kind of have a good little archived amount of content, you can start promoting it in ways that you're really focusing in on that and really kind of trying to reach a new audience instead of spending so much time creating the content. So that's kind of my little secret of how I like to do it. When I started doing this, I saw a dramatic increase in growth. I used to, on average, blog about five to six times a week. I now maybe blog once a month. I know that sounds crazy. Wow. Yes. But every single day, sometimes multiple times a day, I have that content that I've already written going out to my ideal audience through various social media platforms, through newsletters, through podcasts, through ads. And since I've done this, I've not only seen my engagement triple on my blog, but my blog traffic increased over 65%. So that's so interesting because I would have just assumed you are blogging weekly because you always have new stuff. It feels like that you're promoting and driving traffic to, but really you're repurposing some of the older blog posts that you wrote. So you're not actually getting something out there weekly. So I guess this goes a little bit against what I teach. I teach my students to create original content every single week. But I guess if you're a badass in promoting that content and people don't even notice because you always have new stuff out there on social, there's a way to get around that. 
Well, and also too, when you think about it, Amy, the promotion of that content is new content. You know, I'm still maybe having to write a new Instagram post, or maybe I'm tweaking a photo, or maybe I'm tweaking the way that I upload it on Pinterest a little bit. Maybe I'm adding a new Pinterest post. So it's still it's still new content from the social media side of things and the way that you're promoting it, but it's still going back to that original content that you've already promoted. So cool. I love looking at things in different ways and it's definitely working for you. So that might just be a new perspective that somebody can try on and see if it would work for them as well. Yeah. And I think that, you know, with this said, and and I kind of mentioned it before, when you are starting out, you do need to produce more content. So you have enough kind of in your wheelhouse, so to speak, to shoot out. And there are exceptions to the rule. Obviously, if your products or services or posts aren't necessarily evergreen, if they're seasonal or if you're in the middle of of a launch, you're going to have to do a little bit more content creation during that time. Yeah. But I'm a firm believer in a lot of us probably just have archives and archives of fantastic content there. And we just need to think outside of the box a little bit more on how to get that content to new eyes. Definitely. For sure. Now, do you have any favorite tools that you like to use to promote your blog posts? I do. I, you know, tools are kind of a, a, a big thing for me. I, I'm, I'm a tool geek, so to speak. So I have three that I want to say. One, of course, they're going to be obvious for people, but I'm going to tell you why I love it. And then two, maybe new. So the first one, of course, is Google Analytics. But the, the way that I like to use Google Analytics in terms of promotion is that with that 80-20 rule, what I'll do about once a month is I'll go into my Google Analytics and I'll see what have been my top performance performing posts for that time. Because obviously the more that I can generate more promotion for those specific posts and the more clicks that they get, the more eyes they get on that post, the higher they're going to rank on Google, right? So I will specifically spend a lot of time focusing on maybe my top five biggest blog posts ever when I'm kind of looking for promotion. So that's kind of how I like to use Google Analytics specifically when it comes to figuring out what I'm going to be promoting in the future. And then I also love a program called People Map. People Map is actually an Instagram, it's stated as an Instagram marketing tool because it pulls data from Instagram, but you can actually use it for your, because you can export so many fantastic information from, for your blog, for Facebook, and so to speak. So what People Map allows you to do is really search out your ideal audience by those keywords and some of those things that we had just talked about earlier. So once you get a clear idea of what that is, you can essentially use People Map to seek those out. People Map is also a great way to reach out to media. If you're wanting to figure out another way to promote your blog post, you can find media contacts on there as well and essentially pitch them your idea that stems from your blog post. It also allows you to build lists and campaigns. It's a fantastic resource. And then I really love a new one that's actually a Google Chrome extension called Clearbit, C-L-E-A-R-B-I-T. And what Clearbit also does is it helps shorten a lot of the research time, which I'm a huge proponent in saving any time that I can. And it allows you to kind of uh, get to those uh, contacts and get to that information that you may need in the space. It's really a contact generator. So you, let's say that you're looking for a hotel contact and maybe you just did a blog post on travel and you're wanting to align with a hotel brand in the future about, you know, a, a potential collaboration. You can essentially find any contact in the hotel space from there. You can get as specific as listing the actual hotel name or as general as just putting hotel. So I really love Clearbit for that as well in terms of promotion. Really good tools. I'll make sure to link to all of them in the show notes, amyporterfield.com forward slash 186. Okay. So let's talk about something I hear people mentioning online, and that is the health of your blog as it relates to Google. So can you give us any tips so that Google actually sees us as having a healthy blog? Yeah. So from what I have gathered, there, there's really two. I mean, there's a lot, but the two that I want to focus on that I think are the most important would be speed and responsive design. So it's really important as you grow your blog to make sure every 90 days or so that you're checking up on your site speed. There's a free tool. Pingdom is one. There's a ton out there. Pingdom is one that you can use that's free. And what it it does is it essentially checks your site speed for you. So if you go on a Pingdom and you're finding that your site is taking more than a couple of seconds to download, and when I say a couple of seconds, I mean like two to three seconds, then you need to do a little bit of investigating to find out maybe what is slowing it down. It could be, you know, 
unused plugins, or it could be images. Images are a big one. So if it is an image issue, there's actually another great resource out there called JPEG Mini. And if you are an image heavy blogger, JPEG Mini is going to be your new best friend. It's going to help you actually drop the size of your JPEGs down without dropping the quality. So you can still maintain fantastic quality of images, high res images, but you're not maxing it out at the highest. Because really the rule of thumb is that you don't want your blog images to be any more than 80 KB, like at the absolute max. So dropping that image quality that JPEG Mini allows to 70 or 80% will reduce the image file size and then it will really help your site speed a lot. So those are the two things that I like to focus on when it comes to speed. And then with responsive design, What that essentially means is that you want to make sure that your content is discoverable across all devices, meaning tablets, mobile, and desktop. And obviously now that we're into 2017, we're getting into 2018, Google even says that it's really mobile first. I mean, every consumer is starting to buy more and more off mobile than they are on desktop. Google is really focusing in on making sure that mobile sites have a fantastic responsive design. If the responsiveness is taking two seconds or longer, it can actually disrupt the crawling activity that Google does on the back end. So that's another reason why those seconds really do matter. And you want to make sure that Your site is mobile friendly, desktop friendly, and tablet friendly, so Google will boost the ranking of your sites in their algorithm. So the more consumers that are using it and making purchases, the more important it's going to be. Now, when it comes to figuring out, okay, how do I get a good responsive design? Really, for me, the key is the flexibility of the design. If you're with a designer, you could talk with her or him or her about that to figure out what is going to be the best design for you based on what you're going to need in terms of your layout, how many plugins you're going to have, because all of those things factor into the responsiveness of the site. And then also there's great with Squarespace, which is the platform that I use, or even like a WordPress, there's a lot of stuff that they have on the back end that will help you, whether you create your own design or you use a template. And then of course, their customer service is just absolutely fantastic with helping you figure those out. If you're someone who doesn't have a designer, you're signing up to a Squarespace or a WordPress and you just need a little bit of navigating with that, there's a lot of great resources there that they'll kind of help you figure out what's going to be best based on what your needs are. So many great resources. Thank you for this. This is fantastic. As we're speaking about Google, I was thinking about this whole idea of SEO. And I know this is like a can of worms. SEO could be its own episode. However, can you give me two to three things that we should definitely be doing with our blogs to spice up our SEO? Yeah. So I always look to SEO experts when it comes to really getting down to the nitty gritty. Like you said, I mean, you you could do an entire episode on that. What I have come to find, at least with my own site and what has really helped me spice up my SEO, the three things that I have found is that you want to make sure that the site is as easily navigable as possible. You want to make sure that you're linking internally and you want to make sure to check your content for dead links. So I'm going to get into that a little bit of, of kind of what those three things really are. So with making making sure that your site is easy to navigate. You want to make sure that obviously when we're thinking SEO, we're thinking how can we rank to the best of our ability. So you want to really take a fine tooth comb, so to speak, to your site, starting from your homepage and clean up any categories, any kind of dead ends that you have, eliminate that, any thin content that you may have, really make sure that your posts are easy to search and easy to discover. If you have content that is specific to a certain season or a certain time of year, you want to also consider creating tags or categories or subcategories just to make it easier to find those kinds of things. So that's really when it comes to navigating, you want to look at the whole picture and really think of ways that you can, that you can map that out. A good example of what I tried to do, because sometimes we get a little too close to our website. If we see it every day, it's just kind of hard for us to look at it from a naked eye. What I like to do is I'll sit my mom down and I'll say, okay, mom, look at this homepage. Is there anything that you find confusing? Is there anything that you find 
hard to understand? Is there anything that makes you wince because it's too bright or, you know, it doesn't look very well on the screen? I'll ask her these types of questions because I know that she's not really going to be coming from any other type of, of background or knowledge. And she's just going to be as honest as she can with me about it. And it's really surprising that when you do that, when you sit down with someone who may not be as used to your site as you are, what you will find. And that really helps you figure out easier ways to navigate it and ways to kind of move it around. So it's a little bit more user-friendly. Ooh, so good. I knew you'd have some good SEO tips. Okay. So my final question for you is something that you really teach in a unique way that I think everybody needs to hear. And that is that you talk about trigger words. So what are they and why are they so important? Yeah. So when it comes to trigger words, you know, I think we have to just kind of first go back to just the idea of words. I mean, obviously words are powerful and they can literally trigger, you know, someone to think and feel in a way that makes them want to take some kind of immediate action. And the words in our blog posts and the content that we share should really be no different in that idea. Obviously, coming from my background of book publicity, words are going to be something that not only I connect with, but something that I just really hone in on because I know how powerful that they are. So whether you're writing blog copy or a newsletter or social media post or even visual content, you need to be able to integrate the right kind of words. And I call these those trigger words. The triggers are really the words that are going to mold the perception. So let's kind of go back to those five core values that we talked about for a moment, the in inspiring, the entertaining, the educating, the behind the scenes in the community. From each of those, you want to really figure out how you can take those values and then use those words to transform your blog into more of a defining brand, because that's what's going to keep people connected. And that's what's going to keep people coming back. So when you're able to attract and connect, you're able to grow. So you want to start using these words within your copy and content. And you may be surprised how much the engagement and the traffic grows because when you start to use trigger words, people are going to start remembering you by those words. It's kind of like subliminal messaging in a way without it being a negative or manipulative kind of, kind of thing. And so you want to be able to use these words throughout your content so people remember you by them. And how you figure out what your words may be, I actually kind of learned this from a coach of mine. She had me close my eyes and she asked me, OK, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about the words that your family and your closest friends would use to describe you. These can be adjectives or the, these can even just be other words that, just, that describe elements of your personality, elements of who you are. And then once you kind of think about that, I want you to also think about words that business colleagues would use to describe you. How would they define your passion? How would they define your performance? How would they define your struggle, your enthusiasm? And then once you kind of map that out with your family, your friends and your colleagues, I want you to think about words that excite you, that really make you happy, that challenge you, that motivate you. And then the last one that she asked me to do, she said, once you kind of go through that, I want you to try, if you can, to think about words that you see other people use to kind of connect with you and to draw you in. What are those words that other people are using that are triggering you? Because those are equally important to note. So when you kind of think about that, you can start to think about those words that your ideal audience uses and then pull those in as well. So you've got the words that people use to describe you. And then you've got the words that you're triggered by that other people use. And then you want to start really kind of being resourceful and going back to that core audience and thinking to yourself, OK, now what are the words that they use to describe themselves? Or what are the words that they use to describe their pain points or their pleasure points? And then once you get a massive list together, you can start to write those down. Now, at this point, I have about 75 or so words that I use and I literally have them on a sheet of paper and I keep them on my desk at all times. And these words just help me stay in line with not only my beliefs and my passions and my goals, but it, these words really help me trigger that emotional response that I am trying to engage and connect with when I am writing copy. So good. I love the idea of trigger words. I hope everybody listening will actually do that exercise. So I'm going to encourage you all to take a little time, 75 words on your desk. I bet that is so valuable when you're writing, when you're doing social media, when you're doing video, just kind of look at those words and you identify with them so quickly. 
You do. And I think that they change as you change and they evolve as you evolve. Like the the words that I first discovered when I started doing trigger words two years ago, some of them are the same, but then some of them now are completely different. Oh, for but sure. But it's nice that, yeah, you can just add, you can take away whatever, however your, your brand is evolving in that moment, those words kind of keep you again, accountable and resourceful and in line. So very true. Julie, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. All of this has been incredibly valuable. I can't believe we were able to talk about putting together the blog, the SEO, Google stuff, all the tools you use, these trigger words. I mean, we covered a lot. So thank you so much for preparing for the show to make sure that we made it into like a mini workshop for my listeners. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. Now, before we wrap up, can you tell people where they can find out more about you and everything you have to offer? Sure. Yeah. So juliesolomon.net is the website where you can go to. That's where all of my free tips and resources to help you up-level your blog and, and monetize your brand can be found. I'm also at Jules Solomon, and that's J-U-L-S-S-O-L-O-M-O-N on all social media platforms. I do an Instagram Live every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific, so you can find me over there. And then, of course, the Influencer Podcast is every Wednesday over on iTunes and Stitcher, as well as the InfluencerPodcast.com. And then you can head over to JulieSolomon.net as well to check out the course Pitch It Perfect if you are a blogger or influencer out there who needs a little help with your pitch strategy. Strategy, and you're looking to negotiate better rates for yourself and grow more media opportunities. You can find all that there. Perfect. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Julie as much as I have. Listen, she covered so many great tools for blogging as well as she listed so many great blogs that are doing it right. And I don't know about you, but I love to look at examples of other blogs that are getting great traction so I can study what they're doing. So if you want that full list of all the blogs that she mentioned, I have listed them in the show notes. So go to amyporterfield.com forward slash 186. I'll list all the links that Julie mentioned in terms of tools, examples of different blogs, and all of Julie's information as well. amyporterfield.com forward slash 186. Thanks guys for listening. And I cannot wait to connect with you again next week. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast at www.amyporterfield.com.